Hey, good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're joining us in the world, and welcome to the next of the Mechie Alliance Seminar Series Talks, uh, a continuing outreach to engage intellectually as we are uh, continuing to do the work and, and research that we do as academics and, and, and company partners um, and a way to stay engaged. Um, so today it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Lauren Chai, who's a doctoral student in mechanical engineering. Uh, she'll be sharing her work in using acoustic forces, acoustic assembly of organized multi-materials for and during an extrusion process. Uh, Lauren, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, uh, but just want to note to folks that uh, I think you, as you were flagged coming in, we are being recorded. Um, if you can hold your questions to the end and either ask them via the Q&A or the chat or raise your hands, uh, we'll field the questions at the end. Uh, so with that, Lauren, uh, please let's share your screen and uh, take it away. Well, um, actually, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Um, let's see if, do you want to continue? Yes. Uh, wait a second. Teresa, you might need to stop sharing on your screen. I'm not sure. All right, okay, Lauren, I see your slides. Perfect, thank Yay. you. All right, cool. All right, so um, hi again. My name is Lauren Chai. I am a doctoral candidate in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Um, and I'm here to talk about using acoustic radiation forces to organize multi-material um, extrusions. Um, this is with the Computational Instrumentation and Device Utilization Lab under um, Dr. Brian Anthony, you guys may have heard of him, you may have seen him recently. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm gonna get started. Uh, so first I wanna just talk about um, the market of wearables. Um, as you can sort of see, you know, the, the market for wearable has been increasing, but more importantly, the market for smart wearables um, has been increasing even more. And with that, part of the reason is the wearables sort of breaking into healthcare monitoring. And I think uh, one of the most iconic of the wearables right now is the Apple Watch, uh, which has been able, is, which is where they're trying to, com where they're combining uh, fashion with existing functions like GPS and elevation, and then pushing the envelope um, further by including things like ECG, um, which I think is pretty new, um, just within like the last one or two of their um, their models. And healthcare monitoring cannot be separated from um, other from the current climate that we're in, particular uh, in the world of disease monitoring and wearables. Um, particular, you know, some of the metrics are probably going to want to move towards is blood pressure monitoring, um, oxygen saturation, and body temperature. Well, you know, as we're thinking about women disease monitoring, there's one thing to observe here in particular, and it's that none of these three uh, applications are at the wrist. So if you look at the first picture, the blood pressure monitoring, that's at the arm measuring blood pressure within the brachial artery. Um, and then the second picture is oxygen saturation being measured at the fingertip. And then the third body temperature, what they're doing is they're measuring um, the eye duct. Um, and there are other locations, um, but basically the takeaway here is what matters when it comes to a lot of these um, uh, health metrics is location, location, location. Um, so another way to summarize this is that data qual the quality of the data that you collect from the body is going to be tied to the measurement location and therefore the device needs to conform to other parts of the body beyond the wrist. Um, the second big concern for 24-7 healthcare monitoring is patient compliance. You know, it's one thing if the patient goes into the nurse's office and they, you know, spend five minutes sitting there having their measurements taken. But if you want to be able to collect this data over the course of days and even weeks, um, really have to think about how to reduce obtrusiveness 
um, especially when patients are in critical care. And one way you can do that is better integration with clothing. Um, I, I want to go back to the challenge of core body temperature. Um, and you know, what you can see from this picture is that even though there are multiple locations, the, you have to think about like what exactly you're measuring and where you're measuring it. Um, and for core body temperature, for body temperature, you want to be measuring the core, not the extremities. Um, you can sort of see from this picture how blue some of the extremities are compared to the core. And so, you know, because of the need to be able to conform to other parts of the body, both for higher quality data and for improved patient's compliance, um, we need to think beyond, beyond the risk towards thinking about integration, integrating these devices into fabrics and fibers. So, how, so what does this look like, right? So the history of um, devices, you know, we had these large boards um, involved in this like very labor intensive process called wire wrapping. And then that was condensed down to PCBs. And what I'm proposing is to move to woven circuit boards. And so what are the requirements of an assembled circuit? Just at its basis is you have, you have electrical connections. You have to be able to insulate those connections and then you need to, to integrate your active and passive components in those um, connections and insulated parts. And so what I'm proposing is to design the assembly of these circuits into the fiber. Um, and what it's gonna look like is you have a fiber and you need to have parts that are conductive and you also have to have parts that are not conductive, which means that you need to think about a new form factor and you need to, to control the assembly of the components in the cross section, but also axially. And so we need to evaluate because of this, um, also all the manufacturing pillars of a quality rate, design flexibility and cost. And so, you know, looking at the current state of manufacturing of fibers, you can sort of look at it in terms of like how fat, how much we can produce per second. So that's your rate. Um, and also like, how much material, how organized the material is. So um, on the low end of material organization, you have things like electrospinach, which is a single material, but it's very, very, very fast. Um, and then on the other end of material organization is uh, like the semiconductor fibers from Professor Bink's lab in course three in material science, um, which are really complex uh, circuits um, in these large uh, silicon um, glass fibers but the drawing process is really slow. And so to push to that upper right quadrant is gonna require active control where we can design uh, the cross section and also axially. And for this, you know, we have a couple of options. Um, the one I wanna focus on is the acoustic option. So you can, but you can also use like say magnets or um, light waves, but I'm gonna focus on um, acoustic waves. And so what is this gonna look like is we have some kind of bulk material, A could just be like polystyrene or some kind of monomer. Um, you mix it with a functionalized particle. Um, and when you mix them together currently and extrude them, you can abuse things like, you can abuse improved conductivity. Um, and right now what they're doing with it is improved EM shielding. What I'm proposing is then to use acoustic forces um, to create alternating conductive insulating bands within the fiber. So what are these acoustic radiation forces that I keep talking about? So um, on the left is this cartoon of a couple of particles in this space. Um, when you apply um, acoustic waves and they constructively and deconstructively interfere, um, they create nodes of high and low pressure and the particles are moved towards them. And so this is a video of what it looks like if you did it to polystyrene beads in water. So on the left of this container is my transducer um, that's stuck to the glass um, cuvette. And within the cuvette are 10, 10 micron polystyrene beads in water. And so what I've done at the start is turn on the power um, to create these, um, these constructive and deconstructive interference of the acoustic waves. And so what you see here are the beads moving towards those nodes and part, those nodes and anti nodes creating these um, planes of the beads. 
But don't forget, you know, through all of this, we still have to think about the four pillars of manufacturing as we teach it here in um, the Department of Engineering. So you think about cost, rate, design flexibility, and precision or repeatability. And those are, you cannot divorce those from manufacturing. And those become important because this is what you have to consider um, to bring this technology from the lab into um, mainstream devices. And so, you know, thinking in that realm, um, really thinking about, you know, in terms of the acoustic radiation forces, you know, what rates, what rate can we drive it at? And what's the precision with which we can um, create these patterns? And then you also have to think about it in terms of like when we're extruding it and also when we're locking it in place. And so the research objectives um, of my work is to understand through experiments the relationships between these three domains and then understand the trade-offs that we're going to have to make between rates and functionality um, and, and precision and cost. And then also determining the key metrics for, for measuring the quality of the end product, which is going to depend on the end application and what we want. And so, you know, back to what these acoustic radiation forces are. Um, so the main force is this thing called the primary acoustic radiation force, um, which is going to be dependent on uh, Part qualities like the size, how much energy you're dumping in, as well as the frequency. Um, but unlike some other active control methods, what you don't see here is, you know, is it magnetic, is it electric or conductive? Um, and in this way, it is pretty agnostic to the material type um, to some extent. Um, I want you to pay attention to the that um, acoustic contrast factor, which is also what determines whether or not it goes to the, part, the pressure nodes or antinodes. Um, and so this acoustic contrast factor is dependent on the difference between the particle and fluid um, densities and compressible um, sound speed and compressibilities. Um, and so it also determines sort of the strength of the force as well as the direction in which it moves. And then of course we could talking about sound, we have also think about attenuation, um, which will increase with your frequency. Um, but at the, I think at the, sound, at the scales that we're operating at tends to not be as important, um, but just still something to keep in mind. Um, and so with that, I want to move into uh, a sort of section of like one of the applications of this technology, which is increasing conductions in these um, extrusions. So here is an SEM image of um, carbon nanofibers. And if you mix these carbon nanofibers in a otherwise non-conductive fluid, and there is a conduction pathway, you will get conduction. Um, this is the uh, bulk resistivity formula. And what I want you to pay attention is that funny component T, um, which tends to be fairly large, especially for um, particles of long form factor, which means that you know, just small increases in the volume fraction leads to relatively large decrease in the bulk resistance, which means that, in, in other words, by arranging the way we organize these, fire, these particles within a bulk fluid without you know, increasing the actual amount of carbon fibers within the bulk fluid, we can decrease the bulk resistance. Um, so this is sort of a model showing like what we predicted would be the decrease in the bulk resistivity by just increasing the volume fraction um, uh, by compressing it within the fluid. And then this is an experiment we did. Um, so we did was we mixed carbon nanofibers and mineral oil, um, mineral oil being non-conductive. Waited for it to settle a little bit. And then we had a multimeter measuring um, conduction across the top, from the top to the bottom. Applied our um, acoustic radiation forces to see the compressed bands um, of the carbon nanofibers. So this is uh, just a quick a picture of the experimental setup. Um, and this is what we had measured. So um, you sort of see the resistance drop in a little bit um, as things sort of settled. And then at the moment prior to banning, when the resistance um, changes almost zero, you turn the banding on and you sort of see the sharp drop in the resistance and actually it's kind of fun you can by toggling the power on and off you can actually toggle the resistance um, up or down and so you know then it's like how do we lock, what happened lost into place so this is a sample that um, we made um, so this was done in a uv caribou monomer that was also otherwise non-conductive 
And what we did was use the acoustic radiation force to just arrange them into bands. Um, and then, you know, use LED just to show that, yes, we have conduction. Um, this, and so right now we're working on is just system integration to create not just conductive samples, but now conductive fibers. Um, in particular, we're looking with an, doing this with an eye towards integration with existing processes. Um, so you know, it was a lot of time and work spent between developing something in the lab to, to something that's more commercial. Um, and it is a lot of already existing uh, manufacturing processes in in day-to-day -day life, like injection molding, um, FDM printing, and stereolithography. Um, and the reason why we're looking at integration with existing processes is because the infrastructure is already there, um, material supply chains are already there. Um, and I think you know now we're all kind of learn a little bit more about the important supply chains, also in the current climate. And so I think you know parts of the key of bringing this technology to commercial applications really quickly is doing it with an eye towards what already exists um, in the manufacturing space. And so, you know, this, this is sort of a video of um, what we sort of developed. And what you're seeing here is um, the carbon fiber is kind of mixed in, um, in with the monomer and with the UV carbon monomer. And this is it being extruded. Um, and you sort of see these bands um, formed and being held in place with the acoustic radiation work, even as it's being extruded. Um, and then this is a picture of some sample pieces of the fiber where we just extruded and cured it. Um, and so what we're working on right now is integrating all three uh, domains together to get extruded conductive bands. So this is a picture again, you know, all, also all towards the keeping an eye on, you know, cost rate, design, flexibility and precision so that we can get this to applications in um, wearable devices for healthcare. Lauren, did you have other, other slides or was that the? Uh, I think that was it. I might have been talked a little fast. No, that's, that's, that's fine. So I uh, just wanted to make sure that I, I'd like the fact you have the video playing. So I, I send you the, the virtual clap there uh, and you can send the, uh, actually there's a little icon there to send the, the physical clap. Um, for participants, if you have questions, uh, please um, send it in the Q&A or uh, raise your hand. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to kick it off here for a moment, Lauren. And yeah, as you have here in the sort of the pillars of, of manufacturing, the, the rate, quality, cost, precision, you know, what in your mind are the, the dominant rate limiting steps to how you could use this in a extruded um, process? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the dominant rate limiting step is the fact that lots of existing um, materials that we use are high viscosity. Um, so, you know, as your the force is being applied to these um, these particles in the fluid, what's resisting it is going to be drag force. Um, an important part of drag force is the viscosity. And so when you think about things like um, injection, like injection molding processes are very very viscous, but also you know the materials there are also really cheap. Um, and these viscosities are like several orders of magnitude um, higher. Can be like a couple orders of magnitude to several orders of magnitude higher than um, than a lot of existing work that takes place in water. Uh, you have other options, so that's why, you know, UV carabel monomers are so appealing because those viscosities tend to be a lot closer to water. Um, I think the other challenge there exists is doing this at elevated temperatures. Um, but I think the primary rate limit step is going to be uh, dealing with the viscosity issue. Good, thank you. Uh, so there's a, a, a question chatted to me. Um, let's see if I, uh, I guess going back to the slide where you showed the um, toggling of resistance, I guess yeah. it's a, first a question of clarification. Um, that was in fluid or that was in an extruded polymer? That was, this was in fluid. This was in mineral oil. And then the question was, is that possible in 
the in the final product in the final extruded fiber to also to use acoustic radiation for us to uh, modulate the resist the resistance um the final product would have to be well so there are two ways you could do this the final product either i either have to be some sort of fluid um you can't really move a solid within a solid um unless there's a kind of fluid property um, the other way you can sort of think about it is getting variation sp spatially before you cure it. Thank you. Uh, another question here, Chatted. Um, are there limitations in the uh, material mix? Um, so I guess, yeah, so what, what, what polymers are uh, feasible for doing such a, um, a, a process? Um, the main, I think, limitation is, is going to be how fast do you want this? Um, in terms of like, I would say any fluid would do. Um, if it's viscous, it's just going to be slower. Um, I'm going to contrast this with sort of like electrophoresis, where you need to have some kind of um, electrical charge attached. Like you don't have that distinction in these materials. Um, I guess the other limitation is that well not real limitation um is how distinct the particle is acoustically from the fluid um because that's going to determine the the magnitude of the acoustic contrast factor and again like it's not a deal breaker but it does mean that things are going to be slower um thank you thank you um, so, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand or or chat here. Uh, a Teresa, actually, yeah, you had a question. Yeah, I do please, have a question. Ahead. So, mm -hmm. um, as you were talking about wearables and some of the limitations there, I was I was imagining what it would be like to have this as a piece of clothing. I think one of the benefits of having the wrist is it doesn't get dirty the same way like a shirt or pants would. So uh, what are the limitations with having to wash these items more frequently? Or have you thought at all about um, you know, how it might integrate with something that is external to make it so that the parts that you are washing are a little more disposable? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, yeah, that's Let's a good question. <laughs> um, and I guess you know, the integration with existing, like, polymer fabrics um mm -hmm. should make it easier to wash I see. um i think i guess i haven't really thought about this but just sort of thinking um through that part is you're going to want to be careful about uh the wear that fabrics tend yeah. to go through as they're washed so that's a good question yeah. um and I wonder if yeah, it, it might be paired with something that has more of the controls in it too, um, where this might yeah. be maybe like the sensor portion and it would be paired with another device that was collecting the data. I don't know if you've thought about yeah, that. Yeah, so you have like the, the brain of it that's a um, little mm -hmm. smarter, a little more expensive, that part you gotcha. definitely can wash. Um, and then the fabric, I and see. you relegate to the fabric itself the ability to conform and gotcha. collect at very specific parts in the body. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Lauren. So I'll send you my, my virtual and my physical physical clap here. Um, thank you for an excellent seminar and for your excellent work. Um, so Teresa, I could ask you to bring up the, um, the exit slides. Um, and as we're doing that, uh, just a reminder, this is a, a seminar series uh, that is intended to engage our students, our faculty, and our external partners. Um, having a, a talk a week, um, roughly the same time, same channel every week. Um, where we, we go have a student present, a graduate student, a, a faculty member, uh, and then also uh, an external partner. And, and next week, um, Dr. Ted David um, from uh, Lincoln Labs will be, uh, he's the associate or assistant um, division head um, of his division, uh, talking about building systems, prototypes for ground, air, and space applications. Uh, so that'll be next Wednesday at, at the same time, 12 o'clock. So uh, thank you for your attendance and look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Thank you again. Thank you, Lauren. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thanks Teresa. Lauren.